koshas. And the koshas are the system that we use to understand the different layers of the body or the different components of what makes up our being. And this week, it's the prana maya kosha. And you'll notice the word prana is right in there. And prana is something that you hear us talk about pretty regularly in yoga because prana is the energy, it's the life force that we're actually drawing into ourselves when we do our deep breathing. And really any time that we're breathing, as you inhale, you're drawing in vital life force. So prana is that force. And then the second part of the word maya is this sense of illusion. It's the different layers that make up the koshas are the things that aren't the true self. And the true self is all the way at the very core of our being underneath all of those layers of everything else, of our physical body, of our energetic body, of our mind, of our wisdom and our bliss, underneath all of that is what makes up the true self. So this is one of the veils or the sheaths that goes around our true self. And it's made up of the subtle body. So the subtle body is everything that we can't see. It's the chakras, if you're familiar with the chakra system. The chakras, I really like to think of them in um, kind of a different way. So a lot of times when we hear people talking about chakras, we think, okay, <laughs> some sort of crazy new age system. But to make it something that you can really understand and grasp, I think about the chakras as the spaces in the body where we feel different emotions. And emotions are just types of energy. And we know that when something is really going wrong and you get this bad feeling in the pit of your stomach, um, it's a very specific area that you feel that. Or when you feel really sad and depressed, it's this heaviness and this burden around the shoulder area and you draw the heart back. So you feel that emotion very much in this area. There's a lot of different examples of that, but each of those is going to correspond with one of those different energy centers of the body. And we have the root chakra all the way at the base of the pelvis, the solar plexus, or I'm sorry, the sacral chakra, and then the solar plexus, the heart, the throat, the third eye, the crown of the head, and then in some schools of yoga, they think of the aura or the energy that's outside of your physical body as another aspect of your subtle body. And that's one of my favorite ones to talk about actually because the aura is what we project out toward other people. So when you're around somebody, we know that being around certain people gives us a certain feeling. If you're around somebody who's really tense and aggravated all the time, you start to collect some of that onto yourself. You start to feel it. Whereas if you're around somebody who's really calm and peaceful and embodies all of the ideas of grace, then being around them, you start to feel that sense of ease just from being in their presence without even having to touch them. And that's because of the energy that goes outside of their body. And you get to experience that. It's also why it's so important to practice in a group setting when you're doing yoga, because having a group of 10 or 15 people in a room, there's going to be so much more energy to that practice than if you were practicing by yourself. Now, practicing by yourself is also a very important component of your practice, so don't forget about doing that. But make sure that you give yourself that time to practice in a group setting too, so that you can feel the energy that's associated with that. The other parts of the subtle body that we won't get into as much detail about today, but I'll just kind of mention are the nadis, which are the energy channels that go everywhere through the body. There's a central energy channel right through the middle that um, connects all of the chakras together. The vayus, or the winds of the body, and we'll talk a little bit about this in our practice today. The two main ones that we hear us talk about are prana, and prana is the upward lift. When you inhale, it's the lightness, it's the vitality. And then the opposite of that is apana, because we always have equal and opposite forces working within us. The apana is the settling, the grounding, the exhale. It's the letting go. And you can see the body is sort of split in half there. So prana mostly lives in the upper part of the body and then apana mostly lives in the lower part of the body. And we have practices or poses in our practice that will either be more connected to prana or more connected to apana. So for prana, think of sun salutations. We're lifting up, there's a lot of dynamic movement, we're creating energy. 
For apana, think grounding and settling poses like child's pose, seated forward bends, um, deep squatting hip openers. Those are the downward kind of movements, pigeon pose. Things that are connected to the earth and have more of a downward momentum would connect us more strongly to apana. Those two forces are always at work and they're always working with each other. So if you think for a moment about the way that we breathe, we think of our inhale as the way to draw in prana, the lifting force, but to inhale, our diaphragm actually pulls down to create a vacuum to draw the air in. So even though it has an upward lifting force, the diaphragm is moving downward, which requires an amount of apana. Now on the opposite side of that breath, the exhale, the diaphragm has to push up into the lungs to empty that air out. And when we exhale, we know we feel that settling, we feel that grounding, but there's an upward movement of the diaphragm. So even with the breath and those two different movements, there's still a balance there. And that's one of the things that we're going to try to pay attention to and tune into as we're doing our asana practice this week. In terms of talking about what actually affects our vital energy, a big part of it, or a huge part of it, I should say, is our breath, our pranayama practice. The way that we breathe determines whether we're going to increase our amount of prana or decrease our amount of prana, whether we're using a short choppy breath, which is going to make our nervous system very alert and awake, or if we're doing a slow, steady, exhale-based breath, which is going to connect us more to apana, to grounding. That's really the yogi's choice or the teacher's choice of what effect you're trying to have. You would decide which breath you would use to have that desired outcome. All of the poses, all of the breath work and the meditations that we do in yoga are tools. We pick and choose which tools we want to use depending on what the desired outcome is. If you're about to go to sleep, you would do a very different practice than if you were getting to run a 5K. So really, um, tailoring your practice depending on what your next activity is going to be and where you want your headspace to be, what you want your body to feel like. The food that we eat, the more alive your food is, the more prana is going to contain. If you eat an apple, it's a lot better than eating a can of apples that were sitting on the shelf for months and months. There's a difference in the prana content of it. So alive, fresh food, as local as you can get and seasonal, is going to have the best prana content for you. And water, you want to make sure that you have clean water, that it's filtered well. Um, sleeping on a regular schedule, making sure that you're getting enough sleep every night that you feel rested, that your body isn't struggling for energy. Movement and postures. So the way that we move our body, if I move my arms up, I have this nice upward lifting, open kind of feeling. If I let my body fold down and fold forward, it makes me feel more settled and grounded. So the way that I just hold my body when I'm sitting, if I'm slumped forward, that's going to have an effect on the energy that I feel internally and the energy that I'm putting outside of myself. If I'm sitting up straight and my shoulders are back and my chest is up, I'm putting out a whole different energy and I'm experiencing a different energy. So the position of your body and the way that you move it during the day. When you're at work or um, in some other kind of an environment where you have to be professional, your movement patterns are usually very restricted. You sit, you might reach for something. There's not a whole lot of arms everywhere or twisting or bending. You're kind of usually seated in a chair, maybe standing, walking, very restricted movement patterns. Those restricted movement patterns are going to make you feel more tired. They're going to create areas where you just feel stuck and stagnant. Whereas if you take a stretch break during the day, which is a great idea, and you open up those movement patterns and you do a little twisting, maybe you sit on the floor and open your hips for a while, you won't feel like the energy gets stuck or you start to just feel like you have low energy because you've been doing the same restricted movement pattern. When you go home and you do your practice and you open those movements up, all of a sudden you have more energy than you felt when you started your practice. And that's all because of the way that movement and posture affects our energy field. Your attitude and your thoughts are going to have a ripple effect to everything else in your body. If your attitude is really harsh to yourself, if you feel like you're not good enough, the shoulders are going to start to drop and you're going to start to physically feel that and see that in the body. 
Whereas if you have an attitude of being optimistic or being open and flexible, you're going to have a very different posture and it's going to have a different sort of energy that it's putting out. And then finally, the environment, the things that you surround yourself with, and your company, the people that you interact with. We talked about the aura, how everybody has energy that extends with outside of themselves. And some people are more susceptible to being influenced by another person's energy. I know I am rather easily influenced. If somebody around me is feeling a certain way, I tend to absorb that. Some people are more resistant to that, but definitely the people that you talk to are going to shape your attitude and your thoughts. The way that they move is going to affect the way that you move. All of these different things um, are going to have an effect on you. The environment that you're in, if it's a very restricted environment, or if it's a very cluttered environment, you're going to start to feel like you have mental clutter because of all the things that are around you. Whereas if you have a very clean, spacious, bright area, you're going to feel that lightness within you. So all of these things that we surround ourselves with, all of the things that we take into our body, are going to have an effect on our energy, on our subtle body. The way that we feel, how much energy we have to do things, how well we're sleeping, how open we are to interacting with other people, the way that other people react to us. This is all connected in this really complex system of things that we can't even see. You just have to experience it. The practice that we're going to do this week on our mats to focus on the pranamaya kosha is going to focus a lot on breath work because we want that pranayama and we're going to do a lot of twisting, a lot of spiraling kind of movements. It mimics the spiral of the chakras and it's a movement that breaks us out of our normal patterns of being very linear and straight. We create some fluidity to our movement and we're going to do some flows in and out of those twists as well as some sweeping movements with our arms to connect to the upward movement of prana and the downward movement of apana. So I hope that you can join us for our practice to work on the pranamaya kosha. Thank you so much.